Thanks everyone so much for joining us. Um, I wanted to start just by kind of, you know, recognizing what a difficult year 2020 has been for all of us. Um, and I think almost all of us have lost some loved ones, some folks who were really close to us. And I wanted to in particular mention a couple of individuals who are really close to the Medicare for All movement and who were just really important for building this movement up. Um, many of you knew Don Beckler from Single Pair Now in San Francisco who passed away this past year. He was one of the people who hired me actually on the board of Healthcare Now, um, just one of the foundational characters of our movement in Healthcare Now, and also Peg Nosek in, in Houston, Texas, really a key leader of Healthcare for All Texas and just an incredible activist uh, down there. We really miss both of them. And I just wanted to ask everyone to take a quick moment of silence before we get started to uh, just you know, send out our thoughts uh, for everyone we've lost this past year. Well, thanks so much, everyone. I really appreciate that. Um, and I just wanted to say that, you know, since this is our very first year doing our conference 100% online, um, this was really challenging. It was also really <laughs> exciting. Um, we have over 1,100 people registered for this conference joining us, which is hands down the largest Medicare for All event in our history anyway. Uh, so that's super exciting. Um, and I just wanna say that, you know, uh, since we are 100% online, for our activists who are, let's say, tech challenged, um, sorry, you're screwed. <laughs> no, no, no. What I meant to say was, you're going to learn amazing new skills at this conference. Um, so thank you so much for bearing with us on this. I wanted to say just a few words about like the tech parts of this conference. Um, if you are listening to me talk right now, that is a really good sign because it basically means you've figured out how the online conference works. It means you've figured out how to log on to SCED. You've figured out that you need to click on the white circle next to each session if you want to attend it or join that video or Zoom. Um, and you've figured out that 10 minutes before the start of each session, a Zoom link will appear right above the description of that session. So uh, congratulations, you're like 99% of the way there. Um, but if you do run into additional tech issues and you need help, I just wanted to say that um, there's a live chat button right on the conference webpage that you can chat. And during an hour before the conference starts all the way up until the conference ends, there's gonna be a tech support team manning that live chat uh, uh, field. And also at the top of the Medicare for All conference page, there's a few links to take you to the support desk and the email where you can send emails to get help. That's conference at healthcare-now.org. So that's it for all the tech stuff. Um, you're gonna be totally fine basically with the tech stuff unless we really screw everything up on our end. Um, so let's start talking about, you know, the reason that we're all really here, which is winning Medicare for all. So Stephanie, um, one of our conference strategy questions, we have these five strategy questions, is uh, obviously Biden is president and Democrats you know, now control the House and the Senate. Um, how do we keep momentum on Medicare for all when, you know, Democratic leadership is likely to introduce incremental health reforms? You know, are there any measures short of Medicare for all that would actually advance our movement? Um, can you help us like kind of frame this question for the rest of the conference? Ooh, yep. Good contentious question, Ben. Um, yeah, how the heck do we approach that? Uh, I think that we've already heard a lot from some really great speakers over the past week, including Paul Song and Diane Archer, about what kinds of reforms would put us on a path to Medicare for all. And of course, that's basically anything that expands Medicare, you know, lowering the eligibility age, uh, Medicaid's uh, expending Medicare and Medicaid on an emergency basis for the duration of the pandemic, um, improving traditional Medicare, all those things, you know, are things that would make it easier for us to pass Medicare for all. Um, when we when we get there. Uh, other things I just throw into that pot include essential solidaric reforms like ending the Hyde Amendment um, and expanding public insurance to our undocumented brothers and sisters, uh, which California is leading the nation on. And I'm so happy to see so many people from California today. So any reform where you're really chipping away at the divisions in our healthcare system, right? You need an abortion. Sorry, this program won't cover you or you're undocumented, don't qualify, or you're on this plan and so you, you're not allowed into this network, that's something that we can get behind because it's putting us on a path to a truly everybody in, nobody out system. 
And of course, there are those reforms which serve to further entrench the existing for-profit private health insurance industry. So stuff like adding subsidies for ACA plans, which in addition to being a corporate giveaway, is just really the weakest possible answer to the health insurance crisis that we're facing. You know, 35 million people uninsured and another 65 million uh, with really bad insurance. And of course, then there's the public option, which, you know, rather than expands an existing public insurance, creates another program that isn't backed by, you know, the mandatory spending of Medicare. And, um, and for that reason, I think risk pool issues are, are doomed uh, to end it. So, you know, we're always fighting for Medicare for all, but we have sort of a rough litmus test, I think, to adjudicate between immediate reforms. Um, does the reform push us down the road to Medicare for all or does it not? So the question, so what we want to do with these questions really is think about how to answer this question for ourselves and our organizations. Like the first axiom of good organizing, all organizing is local. And um, I'm really happy to be able to take some time to think about you know, that this weekend. Sometimes we're just like really in the nitty gritty and we don't get to like sort of take a step back and, and think more broader and strategically. Um, you may be going through this conference with your local group, your local DSA chapter or a single pair group. I'm a Boston DSA member. I'm also a member of MassCare, uh, which is the state coalition here in Massachusetts. And then of course, Healthcare Now. And I'm gonna be thinking, and I want all of you to be thinking sort of individually and collectively about what campaign, like what con concrete campaigns, what goals for our community, our district or state uh, makes sense in light of, of these opportunities and the situation that we're in right now. So of course, every group is coming to the conference with a different situation, you know, organizing looks different in Boston than it does in rural Georgia. So this is just something we all have to, to wrestle with for ourselves and our groups. Um, and to be thinking concretely about how to push legislators uh, in the coming fights over the immediate COVID package, right, uh, where we are going to have a chance to maybe get some of those reforms that would put us on a path to Medicare for all. Uh, and then there will be just, of course, a reckoning later over the uninsurance crisis that's been precipitated by COVID and made, made much worse by COVID. And, and of course, the longer term fight for Medicare for all. Um, and I think, you know, the reason that I want to emphasize thinking locally, I can, I can really feel the frustration of those of us, you know, advocates who have lived through the takeoff period of Medicare for all and, you know, wondering why we've stalled our progress a little bit, right? We jumped, like maybe we had double the number of uh, co-sponsors in the Medicare for all bill when Trump took office in 2016. And then over the last couple of years, as Amira was talking about last night, um, we did get some really good co-sponsors. We got Lloyd Doggett, um, who's uh, on important committees, and Joe Kennedy, who's actually not in Congress anymore, but he was important at that time. <laughs> um, and so there were definitely some key wins during the last couple of years, but uh, we didn't, we haven't seen another leap like that first one that we made after Bernie Sanders ran on Medicare for all. And I think the way forward here is to realize that, you know, we've completed level one, but the next level is going to be harder, right? There's not a lot of low hanging fruit left. Um, and that's not to dismiss the incredible progress that we've made. You know, many of us in this movement, before, we're in this movement before Bernie Sanders ran for president, before Medicare for all was a household name. You know, we carried the torch through the darkness uh, in a very hostile environment to Medicare for all. And over the last couple of years, we got to watch the seed that we planted bloom. And we should all be really proud of that um, and not forget that, you know, even as we look ahead to what's difficult. But I think that what I've really learned from watching all these great presentations over the week is that, you know, the next half of reps that we have to move to pass this bill are a lot more difficult. They're in wealthier, whiter districts. Many of them are on like the swing, swing district end of the spectrum. So they're not in like solidly blue districts and they may not have as much like progressive organizing in general happening in these districts. So there's just sort of like an infrastructure problem there. Um, and so we have a lot of work to do. And, and because all reps are accountable to their constituents only, you know, they care very little about general public opinion. And I would even go so far as to say, they don't care about their constituents opinion all that much. They really care about whether we, Medicare for all activists in their district intend to hold them accountable for their legislative decisions. And I think this is the most important part, have the capacity to do so. 
Um, and so calling, calling your reps, emailing them, those are going to be good first starts, but um, that's not going to cut it, I think, for the next phase. Um, and this is where I'd really like to hear from you all on the gather space about, you know, it, when you answer this question, um, because I really want to hear from everybody and I'm so looking forward to marinating on all this. But for me, I think intentional coalition led organizing, bringing together groups in our communities, have lots of members, lots of investment in transforming our healthcare system and building a network that can hold our legislators accountable uh, and combat the in inevitable onslaught of insurer money that we're about to experience. That's, when I, that's what's gonna get us, I think, through the next phase. So Ben, I'm gonna have you take the next question. What outcomes in 2021 would mean that it was a successful year for our movement? Yeah, so this is another strategy question that everyone is gonna have a chance to answer. Um, and honestly, this is a question that I think is so important, but I've kind of struggled with the answer actually. Um, you know, what could we win in 2021 that would really mean that we're moving the ball forward on Medicare for all? And I thought Amira's presentation yesterday really gave us some clear 2021 outcomes to fight for at the congressional level. Um, you know, we want to get at least as many co-sponsors when we first introduced the Medicare for All bills in the House and the Senate as we had when we ended the last session, right? That's a really clear outcome that means we're going to be advancing this in Congress. Um, and we also want to fight for hearings uh, in the House and the Senate in the key committees where we haven't already got hearings. Now, people might think that this is like a soft uh, outcome, uh, but it was really, really hard to get all those hearings for the first time in the House. Uh, last session and Democratic leadership fought us all the way. So it's, it was actually a good test of our power as a movement, I thought. Um, and personally, my focus is a little bit more on the outcomes at the grassroots level. Um, and we talked about this in our podcast on Wednesday, for example. Um, I think the most important thing we can accomplish in 2021 is growing our movement, getting more people involved, helping more supporters become leaders, particularly getting some organizing going in parts of the country where we are not strong enough, like in the southeastern parts of the country. Um, this is where I think NNU's distributed organizing campaigns are so important for our movement. Um, but this is going to be incredibly hard to do while we still are facing COVID restrictions, at least for the first half of this year. Um, so I'm really interested to hear what everyone else has to say about our 2021 goals. Um, and let's also talk about, you know, state legislative goals, trying to move the ball on state legislation. Let's talk about media goals. There are so many areas where I think we need to build capacity, and I want to really hear from all of you. So make sure you answer this strategy question when you're uh, on the gather map immediately after this session. And I've seen a couple of questions in the comments about gather. We will explain it more after we get through the strategy questions. Uh, but I want to kick it to Mark here. Uh, Mark, one of the other strategy questions is, what groups or unions in your state are not yet involved in Medicare for All? Who needs to be involved for us to win? How do we overcome their objections and how do we get them on board? Um, do you wanna help us frame this question? Yeah, thank, thanks, Ben. So, so I hope everyone had a chance to uh, review the nightly presentations that we posted every night last week. Um, and if, if you haven't, you can still check them out by clicking on that day of the week on, the, on your SCED app and uh, listening to them. Uh, Monday night, last Monday night, we focused on uh, the topic of healthcare justice and racial justice. And we, we put this first because it's first in our thoughts as we organize this conference, because we know, uh, and, and especially living through this last year, that to win, our movement has got to learn how to center the issue of racial disparity and inequality that lie at the heart of our commodified healthcare system. Um, and in addition to that, we've got to be constantly aware of who we are talking to. Is it the same old crew from the church basement or the union hall that we talk to time and time and again? Or are we reaching out and making room for leaders and organizations that are leading this fight for racial equity? That's the transformational issue that our movement has to face. Uh, also on Wednesday night, um, we released an extraordinary panel that was moderated by uh, crystal ball. It featured three grassroots labor leaders who also happened to serve on the Labor for Single Payer Steering Committee. Um, Ada Braseno, the co-president of Local 11 Unite here in uh, Southern California. Shireen Horizuk, uh, the president of Ask Me Local 3800 in the Twin Cities. Uh, and Cynthia, Cynthia Finney, the uh, president of the Maine AFL-CIO. 
um, they all stressed how important it was to drive change in labor and social movement organizations. And more importantly, to learn how to organize members and overcome the differences uh, that we have among our membership and move them to action. Uh, Stephanie pointed out that we are moving into, um, you know, we've picked the low hanging fruit. We're moving into um, needing to win over support from uh, congressional uh, people in uh, swing districts, more conservative districts, uh, whiter districts. So we better learn how to talk to folks who maybe don't share the same kind of Bernie Mitten view of the world that, uh, that most of you, I would imagine on this call share. Uh, so we better start learning how to do this. And the, the folks on that uh, interview all embraced the organizing strategy that's gonna get there. I call it the uh, solidarity model. Um, and they all have real track records and they talk about it in, in, that, in that section of, of moving people from very diverse backgrounds to action around shared principles and goals. Um, in the labor movement, we call that an injury to one is an injury to all. And that's a method that people, you know, embrace when they talk about how to build unity from people with, you know, various, various uh, backgrounds and interests. I guess, you know, you could also reframe it and say that the health of each of us is dependent on the health of all of us. So uh, I'm really hoping that folks will engage with this question and think about in your state, as Stephanie said, all organizing is local, in your state, who needs to be at the table in order to make this movement grow and prosper over this next period and, and try to answer that question uh, um, effectively. And so now, Stephanie, we're giving you all of the easy questions. The next mm -hmm. question we wanna ask is, what are the greatest new threats to the Medicare for All movement that you see in 2021 and how can we best mitigate those threats? Um. What is this about new threats? <laughs> Did we even vanquish the old threats? Uh, I don't think we have room for more, more, more threats at this point. Um, you know, we're not even at the stage right now where we're fighting Republicans yet. <laughs> we're still in the stage where we're fighting Democrats, um, which is unbelievable really, isn't it? Um, something that's plagued our movement, I think, since basically its inception has been co-option, right, by Democrats. Take the phrase universal health care, for example, uh, that was taken over decades ago by the center. Uh, and that's sort of when we started using single payer and then, of course, Medicare for all, which has seen its own hilarious round of co-option. Uh, anybody was watching the primary debates, there was Medicare for all who wanted, Medicare Advantage for all who wanted, I think. Then there's CAPS, Medicare Extra for all. Um, and I think that this co-option is, it's a good thing, right? It shows that we're gaining in power and the establishment is responding to us. Um, Medicare for all is very popular and they want a piece of that. Um, so I don't know if these are like new threats necessarily, but now that we have this Biden led administration and the full sweep of Congress that is actually expected to pass something, um, that of course means new opportunities for us um, because the opportunity to pass legislation is on the table, um, but also the co-optive threats that have always been there and that you know, the establishment has been developing are kind of coming to the fore now, right? And there are reasons I think this is dangerous and also why I'm less concerned. Uh, of course, it's dangerous because policies that poll really well, like the public option, seem like an intuitive stepping stone towards single payer. Um, and that has the possibility to take, you know, the wind out of our sails. And, and, and I don't know, I don't think that that's, uh, that might could be a threat, I think, to Medicare for all. But fortunately, I think the public option uh, doesn't have really a grassroots movement, actually. There are four public option bills in the House right now, and I think all of them have about a dozen or a little bit over a dozen co-sponsors. Um, you know, increasing market-based reforms like increasing tax subsidies for the ACA. There's no grassroots movement for that. No one's coming out to march for that. And I think the best answer to these counter, these counter moves by the establishment are a strong show of force for the solutions which do have real grassroots support, Medicare for all. Um, and I think this means rejecting a defensive posture towards the public option of whatever, whatever market reforms um, they're gonna put up. And instead focusing and really putting all of our energy into an offensive position for the reforms we wanna see. Um, and so yes, I think there are plenty of threats to the movement in, in the Biden era, but um, I don't think any of them are as important as 
making sure that we capitalize on the moment that we have before us. Um, and yes, there will be messaging fights about public option versus Medicare for all. Um, and there are many people very versed in messaging, but many fewer and more precious are the community and union organizers who are gonna give us the power to make sure that you know this sort of in the weeds policy debate that we have about uh, Medicare for all versus, versus um, some other reform, I think, that we actually have the muscle to pull through what we know is right, Medicare for all, right? And of course, again, that's gonna be a local fight where everyone across the country is gonna need laser sharp focus on their communities and their districts and state. Um, and that's gonna require, I think, a plan of action for how to move you know, your local situation over the course of the year and how to change the conditions. And so I kind of like to switch this question around, um, maybe something to think about throughout the weekend. What are the greatest new organizing and outreach opportunities you see in 2021? And how are you or your organization planning to take advantage of them? So Ben, I'm passing it back to you for our final question. Uh, organizing in 2020 was difficult without the ability to safely meet in groups, and we're likely to face continued restrictions for much of 2021. So what are the most effective tactics and campaigns you have seen from our movement or others that are safe with distancing? So this is the question that I am most interested to hear everyone else's answer to. So please, 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 please answer this question on the gather map uh, after this plenary ends. Um, I'm interested because I, I feel like this was the big question for our movement when COVID struck, uh, but I don't know that we had fully an answer to it, um, uh, especially at the moment, you know, this was, COVID was the moment when we most desperately needed Medicare for all, but it was also the hardest moment for us to like harness and mobilize the power of our social movement. I mean, this past year, a lot of our activists honestly just had to kind of focus on survival first. I mean, Stephanie, you and I were both furloughed at Healthcare Now for a lot of 2020, and I know that we were not alone out there. Um, a lot of our allied unions were just decimated by layoffs. Um, and honestly, I feel like legislators had an easier time kind of evading their constituents when they didn't have to go to in-person town hall meetings. They didn't ha have to show up for office visits. You know, we couldn't just kind of invade their office space and get in, uh, a real person. Um, so. Uh, but we have definitely had some amazing organizing victories in the last year, and I would love to hear how people carried them out, how they were won, because we are going to have another stretch of 2021 where we're still going to have to be operating and organizing under these limited conditions. Um, so I would love to hear how folks have been organizing, you know, kind of Zoom accountability sessions with legislators, um, safe distance outdoor actions, this sort of thing. So please, you know, uh, whatever has been effective locally, um, and not just in our movement, if you've heard things that have been effective tactics in other movements, um, we'd love to learn from those too uh, collectively. This is one of the best things I think that this conference does, is it lets us learn from what's being done that's most effective around the country. Um, so uh, I think that's, I'm gonna leave this one to, to the, the, the conference to end, uh, to answer. So this is, you know, we're getting near to the end of this plenary. Um, and everyone is about to next jump on gather and we'll explain what that is. But first, uh, Stephanie, I think you want to say a few words about how people register for workshops and get in there. And while Stephanie is talking, I would encourage everyone to ask any questions you have during the Q&A, because the, the way we're going to do Q&A here is if you fill out a question in the Q&A section, it's at the bottom of your menu. Uh, just tap the Q&A thing, enter a question, and we will kind of pick some of those questions to discuss amongst ourselves, and then we'll wrap up in, in about 15, 20 minutes and send you on together. So Stephanie, how do folks uh, make sure that they're signed up for workshops that come up next? Yeah, sure. So I think a lot of you have already signed up for workshops, um, but if you haven't, then it's really easy. You go to the SCED uh, and you scroll down and starting at 245, that's the first block. And as soon as you choose one of them and you choose one by just clicking on the little white dot, then all the others will be grayed out because you can only do one per block. Um, but I would just go ahead and sign up for all the workshops that you wanna go, you know, you wanna do for the whole weekend because they're kind of filling up and um, I just wanna make sure that everybody gets a chance to, to get what they want. Um, and let's see, what else? 
to know. A number of our workshops just, you know, they're providing basic information for those of us who are new to the fight. So we have this like unprecedented number <laughs> over what, 1100 people here today. And I'm sure that um, some of y'all are really new to the movement. And so we have, you know, like a Medicare 101, Medicare for all 101, that's gonna be twice um, today and tomorrow. Um, and then we also have workshops that allow activists to discuss experiences and best practices like um, different tactics and tools. For example, the, there's one on the ballot initiative that Michael Lighty is gonna give. I'm doing an online organizing one. Ben's doing power mapping. And then we have also a racial equity track, um, of course, a labor track. Um, working on state campaigns, uh, one that's voices from others movements and tons of other stuff. I think we have 40 total workshops. So please go ahead and just do that now if you haven't already done so. Hey, just one thing to add on that is the workshops are a tight one hour organization. So we will start them right on time. So you need to be there, show respect to the moderators and be there at, at the beginning of the workshop, ready to go. Great. Do we want to start taking questions now, or um, well, anything else? Well, someone just asked. Uh, just someone asked about the uh, if sessions will be available to view post conference. I think we for sure the plenaries will be, but the workshops. It's up to the individual workshop moderator if they want it to be recorded. Um, we encourage them to record it, but also there are some workshops that are a bit sensitive, and so we don't we don't necessarily want to record every single one. Right. We don't want to give away all of our secrets to the opposition. We know that the Partnership for America's Healthcare Future is probably going to be tuning in, maybe attending this actually, um, but we don't want to make it too easy for them. But there are quite a few that, you know, uh, that are more presentation focused that I think we will record and we'll make available to you afterwards. So good question. Um, ben, do you want to talk about Gather? Sure. Or do we going, are we jumping into questions? Why don't we do questions first and then I will, well. Um, yeah, then why, I, why don't we yeah. do questions then I, I I'll give a little comment on something and then you'll do the gather right before we gather. How's that? Okay, happen? sounds good. We'll give immediate, right before you're jumping into gather, we'll yes, talk about how it makes works. Sense. So. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna try to get through as many of these questions as possible. All right, so first one uh, from Catherine Isaac. Great strategy questions, but people often conflate tactics and strategy. Could you please explain the difference? Who wants to take this one? I do, I do. Ben. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, this is actually something, I, I'm gonna be doing a workshop in this first block today on power mapping and how to use power maps to organize strategically. And this is a, basically mostly what we're gonna be talking about. Um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of areas where our movement has room to become more effective. Um, and I think this is one of the most important ones. Um, what often happens is I think we will have folks who get excited about a, a tactic or an action or a campaign because it worked in another state and it might be strategic and you know get them closer to winning in that other state, but it might not make sense in our state. Um, there are some tactics that are really perfect when you're close to winning and you have a ton of power but are terrible ineffective tactics when you're not really close to winning and you still have a ways to go and your focus really should be on uh, getting more people involved, building coalitions, like building more power. There are some tactics that like feel really good personally, you know, like standing out in front of a pharma headquarters and getting yourself arrested. Um, and that, that could be, you know, a, a strategical, that could be strategic a tactic if, for example, you have a whole bunch of new people who get involved with it who otherwise wouldn't be if you get organizations involved. But a lot of the times we're just taking our current group of activists and throwing them at things that don't really advance the ball. They, they don't really uh, grow our power in a measurable way so that we're closer to winning afterwards than we were beforehand. Um, a lot of people in our movement and um, I, know, I know I'm talking to a lot of you out there. I count myself among them. Um, can get fixated on like getting the right messaging or the right framing or the right policy details for our uh, bill. But none of that matters if we don't have the power and the political strength to win it. Um, so you just can't spend, you know, 70, 80% of your bandwidth on messaging trainings and all this stuff. Um, public education, we have to be really intentional about uh, building our power because that is how we're going to win in the end. So to me, 
I think that's the that gets at what what Catherine was was asking, which is sometimes we get excited about the tactic or the campaign and we want to do it, even though it is not strategic. It doesn't move us closer to winning at the end. I got too excited about that question. I promise I'll be <laughs> I'll, I'll be more mute in the next one. I've never seen Ben this animated before. Um, okay, next from Lee Stanfield. I'm going to give this to Mark. Uh, how can we overcome the problem of some union leaders not wanting to advocate for a Medicare for all because it means giving up one of the ways they have been able to grow their union, namely using healthcare as a means of bargaining with employers? Oops, I had a first person who forgot to unmute. Uh, so, <laughs> so look, that, that's really you know what we try to organize around in the labor campaign for a single payer. Um, you know, I think to some degree, Lee, it's, it's becoming less and less of a problem because employment-based healthcare is in such a state of massive crisis. Um, you know, the, the promise of union uh, provided healthcare, you know, works okay when everybody is working. Um, but, you know, we just found out over the last year um, how difficult it is uh, when a million workers a week are losing their jobs um, and all of that, you know, disruption to people's health care. People have learned that this is really not the greatest way to organize uh, access to health care. Uh, and then, you know, you look at the costs uh, that have become increasingly unsustainable. And I would say that, in fact, our greatest problem in the labor movement is no longer union leaders who are defending the uh, right to negotiate healthcare benefits as a way to build their union. It's unions that are worried about disrupting their relationships to um, the political establishment, which uh, continues to oppose Medicare for all. And that's really the kind of challenge that we have to face and take up in the labor movement. And I think a lot of other progressive um, uh, and uh, community-based movements face the same kind of challenge. So uh, I guess I'll just choose one and ask Stephanie to answer it then, uh, since there's silence. Uh, Lee Mercer wants to know if we can get a full court press on state-based universal health care uh, and open up uh, waivers for states like Oregon that want to move forward. Uh, Stephanie, what, what's the state of play on that in your, your opinion? Sure. So um, as many people know, Canada got its single payer going first district by district. So it first had um, a single payer hospital program in Saskatchewan, uh, and then it sort of expanded out from there. And I think that the state-based approach is um, very likely the one uh, that will get us to single payer, although I can, I can also easily see an avalanche happening as well, and it happening at the national level, um, sort of in one swell, uh, fell swoop as well. Um, and absolutely, I think that we should uh, be advocating for, um, uh, I, th I think if you're speaking about Ro Khanna's bill, that would allow, uh, that would sort of institutionalize the waiver system that would allow um, states to, to implement single payer systems. And that would sort of pressure the Biden administration to start really, you know, um, working with us and putting us on a path to single payer. I think that's also a really good, like, um, sort of incremental push uh, on Biden on Medicare for all. Um, so absolutely, I think that, that that should be something we talk about. Um, ben, can I give you the next one? Sure. Okay, this from Heather Clark. Just as all politics is local, all politics is also personal. We know which districts are not on board yet, but which of these reps are personally most likely to be uh, to shift their position through some combination of personality, ambition, vulnerability. In other words, who is the next Joe Kennedy? That was almost a poetic question um, <laughs> at the start. Um, thank you, Heather. Um, and Heather is one of our activists in mass care. Hi, Heather. Um, so, you know, my, my personal orient, uh, inclination and orientation towards this, and this could be, this could be the wrong way, but my, my tendency is to ignore the personalities of legislators and to really focus on the capacity that we have in their districts. Um, I mean, when we moved Joe Kennedy and Heather, you were a part of this, so you know, uh, you know kind of how this happens. I mean, we built a massive coalition of unions and organizations in his district. 
who asked for him and uh, was were willing to expend some political capital to push him. Um, this was, you know, the teachers union, the nurses union. We had a bunch of grassroots organizations that specifically organized cities in his district. Um, and then when he said no, he wouldn't sign onto the bill. We said, okay, well, we're going to canvas in your district every day for the next, you know, month until you sign onto the bill. And then we followed through with our threat. We got people to go out and uh, we knocked on doors. We stood on street corners and we had people call him into his office until it was just a flood of, of calls. And um, it was a demonstration of power from his district and from his constituency. And everyone we talked to said, I, have no, I had no idea that he's not supporting the bill. Um, so I, I would personally ignore their foibles, whether they're ambitious, whether they're greedy, all that stuff, and assume that if you build enough power in the district, you will be able to get your legislator, unless they're, you know, a Republican total right wing ideologue, in which case it, that will be very difficult. But I think most Democrats in the end are going to be movable uh, with an overwhelming show, show of force. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Um, I think we have time to take probably one last question. And I'm getting a lot of questions. Um, I'm wondering how many of you actually watched, you know, the pre-recorded videos we did this week, because there's a lot of questions about the public option, which we did two videos on. Um, but Mark, do you want to take a public option question? Why isn't the why is the public option not a path to universal health care? Yeah, so a public option basically adds another health care choice to a marketplace of health care choices. And so what it, it rebuild re, is based on a, this commodified notion of health care that you buy a health insurance product. And in some ways it turns a, you know, a public social insurance program like Medicare into a insurance product that people can choose to buy or not to buy. Uh, so it doesn't change the, the un underlying dynamics of organizing a system uh, for profit versus organizing it as a public good. Um, and it has all kinds of just inherent problems because of that. Um, you know, there, there will be an incentive for private insurers to push their uh, most difficult, costly customers onto the public option. And they'll find all kinds of ways to do that, uh, which will then undermine the public option and it will go into a death spiral. Um, and then the politicians will say, you see, this is what happens when you let the government run the healthcare system. It costs twice as much as the Blue Cross plan. Uh, so, um, you know, the, the sort of adverse selection is the technical word for that. Um, um, is just, uh, you know, it's inherent in the nature of a system like that. Uh, lousy, cheap products uh, always push out quality public, public goods. Um, and then, you know, related to that is that it does not address the kind of inefficiencies um, in the healthcare system, because you still have multiple plans and uh, multiple payment models and everything else, which means that you're not going to get to the cost issues of, uh, of uh, the cost savings that a single payer Medicare for all system can do. Um, so you're going to end up with a system if you really want to cover everybody, um, and now you got to pay market cost for healthcare rather than the, the 20 to 30 percent that you could save under a single payer system because you eliminate profit taking and all of the administrative overheads. Uh, you're going to end up with a, a system that costs way more than it currently costs, which will create its own inherent instabilities. Ben, do we want to answer one more question about force the vote before we move on to gather? Oh, that's a tough setup. I mean, <laughs> we are we are running out of time, but it's okay, hard okay. not to. Okay, okay. We don't have to. <laughs> uh, I mean, we have to squeeze two more things in in the next four minutes. But okay, we we are not afraid of talking about force the vote. Obviously, um, we did a whole podcast. <laughs> we did do it, a so. whole podcast right. on it. So if you want forty five <laughs> minutes <laughs> of our opinion on force the vote, which I can fully understand, where the force mm -hmm. the vote the frustration that I referred to earlier in my talk about we're frustrated because we're not getting where we need to be. And I, I can feel that and I understand it. Um, but yeah, if you, we do have a podcast 45 minutes on force the vote content. So um, Ben, I'll let you take the rest of the program. No, okay. no, I have one more important thing we That's need right. to do. I'll, I'll kick oh. to you at the end, Mark. Yeah. Um, so um, 
And I will, uh, to plug my workshop once again, if you want to go to the power mapping workshop, we will have a full force the vote discussion in the workshop. Um, so uh, I said at the, the beginning that if you've made it to here, you've basically cleared most of the tech hurdles for participating in a conference. But there is only one more tech hurdle you have, which is to uh, use the gather map. So gather is a website where you get to walk around a, a literal conference map as a cute little 1990s video game character. Um, and as soon as uh, one or more people walk near you, their video and audio shows up on your screen, much like a Zoom call. So you're kind of walking around a map and as people get close, uh, they talk to you just like uh, what happened with an in-person conference. Um, we were really worried that with a 100% online conference, we would lose the ability for people to, you know, just like informally chat with each other, to run into new people, to network, to compare notes, all that stuff. So gather is the answer to all of that. Um, now the map is, you're gonna see it has a big, you'll be dropped in this big green grass area in the middle. It has a north wing, it has an east wing, a south wing and a west wing. And the south wing of the gather map has all of the conference strategy questions. And you walk up to them, you press X and you'll be taken into a whiteboard where you can add your own thoughts and comments about the answers to the strategy questions. And you can talk to all the other people who are gathered around the map who are also answering the question itself. So I really encourage you to discuss this, the strategy questions with everybody else. Um, but the other the wings of the map have, you can play games, there's some educational videos in one wing of the map, um, and there's a lot of private meeting spaces if you just wanna have one-on-one -on -one meetings or small group discussions. So uh, that's gather. I, as soon as I stop talking, I'm gonna start putting the gather link into uh, the comment section. I see Jeffrey has already started doing that. You can also obviously find the link by going to the next session, the gather session on, on SCED and you'll find it there, but I'm gonna start posting the link in the comment section so you can easily find the link. So I look forward to running into you all on the map on gather. Mark? Yes, before we gather, however, there's one more important thing we have to do here. Uh, in the past, when we've met together, we've always passed the hat at these conferences. Um, so now we're gonna pass the virtual hat. This has been a really tough year for fundraising um, and we really need to step up right now and uh, um, put our hands in our pockets and make sure that we uh, help pay for this. Uh, Stephanie mentioned that the Healthcare Now staff was on furlough for a good part of last year and yet they were still able to put together this conference and all of the other um, magnificent work that uh, they do on a shoestring budget. Uh, the money for healthcare now comes from individual contributions and a few, uh, few unions and other organizations that help to sustain this organization. So um, um, we have got to put some money on the table for healthcare now as, as part of this uh, conference. And I think Ben is gonna post a, uh, a link where you can give money uh, using your credit card or PayPal to uh, Healthcare now. Now, I would suggest that um, you know you saved a whole lot of money by uh, not having to fly to a conference. So you know, some of you maybe why don't you give us what you would have paid for plane tickets to come to uh, uh, the healthcare now? How much did you spend to go to Portland last year uh, on airplane tickets? Uh, how about how about those of you who had to stay for two or three nights in a hotel? How much did that cost you last year? Maybe you could. Uh, uh, put a portion of that into the healthcare now pot uh, for the next year, or even meals. What did you spend for three nights of uh, dining out at our conferences in Chicago and Portland and Oakland and all of the other places? Um, you know, uh, give us a couple of meals and that'll help uh, help uh, pay the costs. And if you can't pay it all at once, there's a uh, uh, ability for you to do this as a recurring contribution so much per month over the next uh, period of time. Um, and that's you know a, an easier way to do it. You don't even have to think about it. It'll come out of your uh, credit card or your bank account on a monthly basis. So please uh, dig deep. This is really important. We really need to do this to sustain this. This is a huge part of healthcare for now's operating budget has always been contributions at, its, uh, at our annual strategy conference. So you gotta make this happen folks if you wanna keep this uh, organization alive. Okay, I'm done. Let's go. Right. Yeah. And I, I wanted to, uh, thanks to the people who noticed that the link was actually broken. Um, SCED uh, kind of changed the link, added another HTTP to the beginning of the link for the gather thing. So thank you so much for catching that. 
I've edited it on the sched schedule and we've reposted it the, the correct version. So uh, we've narrowly averted another disaster. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> we'll see you on the gather map and you see the donate links are in the comments section. Bye, everyone. Bye. -bye.